DJing for um, this kind of stuff that I'm working on later. But also, I'm really interested lately in trying to think broadly about the kinds of media that we engage in our work as historians of science, technology, and medicine, or really in our work as humanists. So as you just heard, um, one of the things that I'm spending a lot of time doing lately um, is hosting this series of podcasts. And I'm interested in, um, and this is actually a really good book, um, Gabrielle Hecht's <laughs> book on being nuclear. Um, but what I'm sort of interested in is taking seriously the different sorts of modes of the being of an academic self as forms of performance. So what does it mean if we take seriously the talk as a, a material encounter, as its own kind of product? conversations or interviews about books as their own kind of product rather than kind of shifting them to the sides of our academic life as things that we kind of do um, in our free time or talks as a sort of precursor to the real thing which is meant to be you know the written text and so what I'm going to do today um, is try to take seriously the a way of thinking about a talk as an encounter in time, as a moment in time, and try to do something with you that ostensibly we couldn't be doing if I were to have just sent you a paper, which is a paper recording of exactly what I'm saying. You spend 45 <laughs> minutes of your time in your pajamas reading it, and then we call it a day, right? Sort of why am I fly, flying all the way out here? Why are you making time to come and, and talk with me? And this is hopefully um, going to be at least trying to begin to honor that. So among the media that I'm interested in working with right now, in addition to sort of this podcasting and interviewing, is, as you heard, work as a DJ. Now this is very new for me. I've only actually played out once. Um, and you, and the, the initial, I'll show you, this is actually video proof of that. Um, we can talk about that if you want another time. I'm available for historical parties, celebrations of 30-year reviews. Um, totally, I'll, I'll be your historical DJ. I'll be your private DJ, your DJ for money, as long as it has to do with history of science, and not necessarily for money. But work as a DJ. Now, I came to this relatively recently in the past six months um, with an interest in DJing as a form of storytelling. So what does it mean to think about the craft of the DJ as someone who's constructing a narrative in time? And how might thinking about that, um, this was the question I brought to this craft, how might thinking about that and trying to practice that both give me a way to think and talk about something I'm interested in right now anyway, which is sound and musicality in the history of science, but also how might that then help me think about in different ways and practice in different ways my work as a historian. And so this is about not, um, again, and I'll say this repeatedly probably, not the history of DJing, not the history of music, not sound studies as part of the history of science. This is about DJing as a practice juxtaposed with the practice of the historian and what comes out of that juxtaposition and what kinds of questions come out of that juxtaposition if we spend time doing that. So the title last night, A Historian Saved My Life, does anybody recognize that as a bad pun? Okay, so clearly this is a pun on last night. A DJ saved my life. I cannot recommend that you go and YouTube this video, um, but it does exist, um, and it is, it's, a, it's a song. And a song that spurred the, um, or that inspired the title of this book, which actually is one of my first forays into learning about DJ history and culture. Last night a DJ saved my life, the history of the disc jockey. Again, I can't recommend it as sort of a, well, I'll say it's a very spirited history, um, and I learned a lot from it, and the, my title is a play on that, okay? So, I'll, and I'll, we can talk about that in more detail if you'd like um, later on. Okay, so this is ultimately about making time to focus on narrative structure in the history of science, okay, not just, you, not just taking for granted narrative structure to get at the real, um, sort of the real content, but really focusing on narrative structure as the content of what I'll be talking about, and also using it at the same time to think through narrative structure and textual structure um, of the materials that we work with as historians, right? So it's about looking seriously at narrative structure, both of my archive and of the materials in our archives, broadly construed, and also the narrative structure um, of the historian who is creating a story about that archive. If we do this, it's a kind of act of translation, okay? 
It's a translation that I want to suggest produces a new kind of narrative that by extension produces different kinds of historical objects than other kinds of more linear um, historical narratives. And I'll, I'll show you an, a very clear example of what I mean by that in a moment. Okay. So this is explicitly, and I want to sort of ask you to think about this early and we'll think about it often because I'll keep bringing this up at different moments. This is explicitly a suggestion for how to think about creating a historical narrative not as a set of causal linkages, not as this happened and then this caused this and then this caused this, but rather a narrative that proceeds from juxtaposition, not from linear causation. Okay, so uh, and I'll sort of show you what I mean by that in a moment. So it's not a history of DJing, it's history as DJing. The larger project this is part of is firmly in the history of, and I'll sort of explain this in a moment, the Qing Dynasty. Okay? It's part of a larger project um, that I'm calling tentatively Qing Bodies Exercises in Style. Does anyone recognize this? Okay, I'll explain to you what's going on there in a moment. This is inspired, the title is inspired by um, a work by this guy right here, Keno, called, or the English translation called Exercises in Style, um, and I'll explain to you why in a moment. But the Qing, Qing Bodies. This is a project in which I'm trying to, as a historian who works on China, really get rid of China as an object in the history of science or as an object that we take for granted. Okay? So it is trying to do a history of science and medicine conceived of here as a history of bodies that moves away from a simple story about China as a trans um, historical non-problematized object and a form of identification and looks at particular sort of co local contexts within the broad frame of what we call Chinese history to try to get away from a characterization of bodies, of science, of medicine as Chinese, as unproblematically Chinese and as the kind of quintessential globaling other. Um, so this is a project in which I'm really trying to advocate a move from thinking about Chinese bodies to thinking about Qing bodies. Okay, so how many historians of China here? I'm assuming not many. Great. The Qing. What is the Qing? Okay, so the Qing dynasty, and I'm giving you this, this super quick and dirty version here. The Qing dynasty, and this is an image of the dynasty at its largest extent, was roughly about 1644 to about 1911, depending on where you're going to cut the pie. Um, this is a period in Chinese history that's become really, really interesting to historians who are interested in empire, who are interested in trying to integrate stories of China more complicatedly and with more texture into larger histories of empire and global histories. This was a period in Chinese history where the land mass occupied by the dynasty or controlled by the dynasty doubles in size. So at the highest extent, the Qing is actually larger than the PRC today. Okay, this, is a, this is a hugely important and hugely transformative period in Chinese history where what China was really qualitatively transformed. It was a period where um, Tibet, Mongolia, Taiwan, lots of different peoples, languages, cultures, ways of knowing about the world are becoming consolidated as part of the empire in a new way for the first time. So it's really, really fascinating if what you're interested in has something to do with translation of knowledge, multiplicity of knowledge, if one of the things that you're trying to do and clearly or very explicitly one of the things I'm trying to do is to take apart a notion of a uniform essentialized China as an unproblematic whole that can be characterized solely by looking at all things Chinese language, etc., etc. Okay, noticeably, importantly, the Qing are ruled by a group of people called the Manchus. This is roughly where, I love this thing, this, isn't that much more effective? This um, is, is roughly where the homeland of the Manchu people is, although the construction of the Manchus as a people is also relatively late. We can talk about that if you want to, but even if you don't want to, this is where the Manchu people are. They do not speak, their, their language is not Chinese. It's not related to Chinese. This is a conglomeration of peoples, some nomadic, some not, that take over the dynasty, that do not have Chinese as a primary, as their first language, and as a result, really, really transform the linguistic land landscape of the dynasty, and this is what I'm really interested in. So my interest in this period and for this project, and we will get to DJing, I promise you, this is just understanding where this is coming from. My interest in the project is to really take seriously 
and take playfully the importance of the Qing as a multi-ethnic, multilingual empire. Okay, and a multilingual empire for which translation was absolutely central to not just knowledge making, but to diplomacy, to the running of the empire, to all aspects of Qing social, cultural, political life. So this is about, for me, um, a history that's really interesting from the perspective of translation. What do, you, what do you do when you work on a period of Chinese history where Chinese is not the main language? For hundreds of years. We don't have an account of this in the history of science, so let's make one. We'll start doing that now. Well, hopefully we started a little while ago, but we'll, this is part of that. Okay, so this is one document that kind of epitomizes this visually on one page. And what this is, is one page of a larger than or greater than 5,000 page dictionary that's in five languages that's produced at the end of the 18th century. This is a dictionary called the Qing Pentaglot, okay, the Wuti Qing Wenjian. In each column, and I'll show you this, on each page, and this is a kind of visual performance, there are five of the main languages of the Qing Empire. So if you go through, you'll see the head language is Manchu. This was the Qing language. It was Qingwen, okay, and this is the top one. Then you go down Tibetan equivalents of those terms, okay. These are Manchu language transliterations of how this Tibetan is spelled on the top. Use this again. Okay? And how the Tibetan sounds when pronounced correctly. This is Mongolian equivalents of the same terms. Then we have Turki Uyghur equivalents of the same terms. Mansu transliterations of what the Turki Uyghur sounds like. And finally, at the bottom, Chinese. Okay? So each column represents one term. Okay? And this dictionary is set up topically, so that in more than 30 different uh, topics, sort of topical categories of words, you have Again, collectively, more than 5,000 pages like this that are set up in columns, each of which represent a set of equivalent terms in the five scripts of the empire. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that I'm interested in. When you start taking seriously Chinese history as looking like this, how does that change the way we understand knowledge making in this context? And it changes it pretty dramatically. So specifically, this project is about looking at the construction and experience of bodily language from this perspective, looking at how translation practices, again, in this context, are are actually producing certain kinds of bodily language and taking textual form to be one of the things that I'm looking at as I try to look at how texts and languages are producing bodily knowledge. Okay, and this is from um, a text that I'm going to tell you a little bit about later on when we get there. So back to this guy. So this is where this all comes together in this Qing Bodies project. It's a play on this book right here exercises in style, at least in spirit. And what this book is, this is a book in which the author, Kano, decided, I'm going to take a story, simple story. Guy walks on a bus, sees somebody have an altercation on the bus, gets off the bus, later on sees that same guy that was in a fight, like talking to somebody else about a button. That's it. That's the story. So the question is, what happens if you tell that same story in 99 different ways, 99 different times, as a haiku, as a letter, as a, a text in which every word is duplicated, as a series of onomatopoeias, as a love song? What you get are 99 versions that are all the same story, but all completely different at the same time. They're translations in effect. And this is basically what this book is doing. What this book is doing is it's taking key texts that come from the translation of bodies in the Qing period, okay, including, but not limited to, medical recipes, works of Materia Medica, anatomical texts, and thinking about what happens if we put front and center textual form in trying to understand the work that these texts are doing? And what happens if we read a medical recipe at, in that form in different kinds of ways? What happens if we read it as a three-act drama? What happens if we read the same recipe as a set of assembly instructions, as a fairy tale, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. So this part of it is not what I'm giving you today for, for the rest of the term, or for the rest of the, the rest of the term. Someone's been teaching for a full semester, can you tell, for the rest of the tar time together. I'm not going to give you examples, but I, I mention this because this is the background from which what I will be doing today springs. And so this is important to understand, to understand why you come to the kind of case study that I'm going to bring out to you today. But I'm happy, at the same time, to talk about this during Q&A with anyone or at dinner with anyone because I have actually worked up several parts of this already. Okay, so ultimately this is about at its root 
taking seriously and pushing to the foreground the media of knowledge making. Okay? Just really putting that front and center and asking what kinds of narratives come out of it. So the medium of knowledge making that I'm interested in for today um, and that I came at this project with is the medium of or the set of media surrounding sound and the sonic in translating Qing bodies. And what I'm trying to do here um, is sort of consider an approach that offers a different kind of question than I think we typically have when we look at Qing history about Qing bodies. So again, um, just to remind you, and I promised you I would be reminding you this at every step of the way, or several steps, it's not a genealogical account of specific communities or textual genres that can be related causally. Okay? Instead, what I'm going to show you is a way of using the craft of the DJ to kind of model and analogize the creation of a different kind of bibliography, a different kind of archive from which um, a historical object is going to emerge, and we'll talk about that object. Okay? This generates a very different kind of historical question. So the kind of, um, what I'm going to proceed now to show you, doesn't, this is not the kind of analysis that's going to be able to answer certain kinds of historical questions that come from the history of science. Instead, it's trying to produce a space for other kinds of historical questions. Okay? So it's a history with the sonic. It's bringing together these two crafts. Okay? So what I'm going to do from here on in is we're going to do three things. Right? I'm going to show you now what, at least in the very schematic, super schematic terms, what does a DJ do? What are these craft elements that I'm going to, that I'm talking about, or at least some of them? How can we, so that's the first thing, then how can we analogize them to what a historian does? So what happens when we do so? And what happens when we then flip it around and look at history as an art of the DJ? And I'm going to give you an example for at least recently what's happened in my work when I've done this. Right? So we're going to start off this um, three-part um, little extravaganza, or little, not extravaganza, a little exploration by looking at the DJ as a storyteller. Okay? So what are the components of the craft of DJing as storytelling? Let's, let's look at at least some of them. Okay, component one, narrative arc. When you are DJing in a set, what you want to be doing is not just playing a bunch of songs, okay? And so I'm going to be, I'm, this is part of what I'm arguing. This may not be your experience. Um, uh, going and listening to DJs, it may not be your experience DJing, but this is how I think of the craft of the DJ as a storyteller. Okay? You want to ease in to your, your sort of set of songs, and you want to tell a story through your progression of songs. Okay? So usually, you're going to kind of ease in. There's going to be some sort of peak or dramatic climax. There's going to be a crescendo, and then you're going to ease the room back out. Okay? So you can think of a progression of songs by the DJ as creating a kind of narrative arc in time. Okay, two, narrative voice. When you are looking at the programming that a DJ has made, um, or when you're thinking of doing this yourself, typically you want to preserve, at least on some level, a kind of consistency in narrative voice. Okay, so you don't want to do what I've done before, and I don't recommend this, which is putting like Harper Valley PTA next to. Um, like Rasputin, okay? Like you, you, you don't want to be putting together um, country music, um, slow jams, you know, classic like Bach and like acid techno necessarily into the same set. Maybe you're a genius and that'll work for most of us. That'll really sort of make the room that you're playing to really confused and maybe not a productive way. If confusion is your goal, great. If not, um, it's something that you need to be taking, um, taking for, uh, seriously. Narrative pacing. So one of the things that you're doing, again, in the storytelling craft of the DJ, is you're trying to preserve in the transitions from song to song a kind of consistency of pulse or a consistency of beats per minute. Okay? This isn't, and this isn't necessarily just between songs, between elements of your set. It's also, some argue, um, sort of look, trying to create a resonance between the beats per minute of a song and the beats per minute uh, or, and the pulse and the heartbeat of the human body. So I'll show you. Um, don't worry, it goes blank and then it comes back again. So when you are, I'm going to be showing you um, a few times now. This is a program that I learned on. So up here, this is showing you, and I'll show you how this works in a little bit um, to the extent that we have time to do that. Here's a song loaded here. Here's a song loaded here. This is your BPM. Okay, I've synced this up. So this is, but if I don't sync it, Okay, there's the BPM there. So the idea is to somehow across your programming um, maintain a kind of 
consistency in the pacing and in the BPMs to some extent of your of your songs. Okay, so we've got narrative arc, narrative voice, narrative pacing. Don't worry, I try this, it's going to come back. And finally, audience. You want to be, as a DJ, sort of taking seriously and being very attentive to the experience of the people who are experiencing your narrative and adjust along the way, if possible, in order to maximize that experience. It's, a really, it's interactive, it's a really important part of this. Okay, so storytelling equipment. What equipment does a DJ use? Again, this is my schematic, very simple explanation to do so. Well, you have your raw material or your archive from which you draw your narrative elements, and that can include vinyl for really old, you know, really sort of die hard vinyl DJs. Um, it can include, and this is what um, a lot of us do MP3s, sort of electronic files, it can include vocal files. Then you need translation equipment, okay? You need something that's going to allow you to translate these fragments in your archive into pieces that can fit together and that can be part of the same story. And so this can include, um, this is just from mine, um, a kind of, and I'm, I'm going to be very brief about this here, but I'm happy to talk about elements of this equipment at any point later. This can include a, a, kind of a physical controller um, with, through which you actually are um, controlling a computer program that actually allows you to um, mix these elements into each other. Okay, so these are basically you can see, these are basically the basic elements that I want to introduce in order to enable the kind of analogy that I'm now going to make and then motivate um, for you guys the explanation for why this case study I'm going to show you actually has to do with this. Okay, so that was, so how do we take this now um, and locate this in the history of historiography or the history of craft. You can already probably start to see some of those resonances, right? Simply in my choice of terminology. Describing a set of songs as an archive. Um, but talking about narrative craft, but let's look, um, let's look very specifically. Okay, so steps in the craft of a storyteller, of a DJ, and for each one, I'm gonna take you through DJing, and then we're gonna look at the historical analog, and then we're gonna put it all together afterwards. Okay, making an archive, programming and selection. This is terminology for choosing what your fragments are, choosing the songs and choosing the materials you're going to be putting together. And it's absolutely vital to reflecting, not just, the, not just to shaping the narrative, but to reflecting the narrative voice of the DJ as storyteller. So obviously, sorry you can't really see this very well, but this one is pretty simple, right? Constructing an archive, choosing a source base, there's a pretty um, clear analog that we can draw between this and the art of the historian. Okay, so programming and selection. Two, historical fragments and sampling. The second or one of the second major tasks that a DJ does is basically selecting and then repurposing fragments from the larger sources that they're working with, okay, from the songs or the other sound elements, the other kind of sonic landscape elements that are being integrated into a narrative and taking out selections that can later be juxtaposed and repurposed to create another kind of narrative. So for example, let's say you want to tell a story during your set that has something to do with the progression of a heroic figure. Okay? You're interested in, tell in sort of DJing a set where you're telling a story about a hero, about the progression of a hero. Maybe it's useful to you to be able to juxtapose in ways that aren't necessarily um, otherwise obvious. The sort of okay, good, the bad, and the ugly, Clint Eastwood, you know, the hero in the Wild West with Mad Men, okay, and there's a, there's a particular, um, I was trying to do this, I'm trying to tell a story about Don Draper as this sort of heroic figure and this tragic heroic figure and sampled out sound clips from this one episode where Sally walks in and see, finally sees evidence that he's had an affair with the neighbor's wife. I don't know if anybody saw this, but if you start juxtaposing the, like, <laughs> with Sally Sally open the door I need to talk to you I love this one that was comforting this is 
Okay, you can you can start putting creating stories about maybe the heroic, maybe the tragic, maybe the absurd um, of the uh, of the sort of story of the hero in ways that you can't necessarily do by keeping these two elements consistent and separate. And sampling allows you to do that. Okay, historical analog. Again, you can sort of think about this in terms of that are. It, pretty self-evident, right? Quotation and citation. What are we doing when we take, when we cite and we take quotes from other sources? We're basically sampling, okay? It's basically a very similar kind of an uh, activity that's about finding or creating fragments to work with it that we can later juxtapose and repurpose and combine, okay? Or mix, right? So this is three, element three of this art of the DJ that I want to sort of ask you to anal analogize, juxtaposing and recombining fragments or mixing together. There's an art here, and this is about taking two songs, again, that don't necessarily, or two sets of sounds that don't necessarily seem like they belong together, and fusing them, sort of, it's a kind of translation, fusing them or mixing them such that they sound like they belong to the same unit, okay? This is going to be really, really difficult. Um, so for example, uh, this is going to be, for example, Harper Valley PTA, contact me. This is the kind of thing that you can do. And I'm going to, again, this is historical. Um, and I can explain to you some elements of this after. But just to kind of show you what does mixing involve. So that doesn't really. Well, actually, let's do that. Okay. Okay. So you can sort of see this is again. I'm just trying to show you sort of what I mean by illustration. But you can kind of see one of the arts of learning how to DJ is figuring out how to take things that don't seem like they belong together and um, mixing them and translating parts of them so that you're making them part of the same story. So this is basically a kind of translation. Um, and we can talk about um, how that works and why that works in a moment. And it usually is done um, somewhere in the intro or the conclusion. Historical analog. Combining fragments to tell a larger story and constructing specifically, for me, synthetic and transdisciplinary narratives. I mean, we're basically doing effectively the mixing of country music and techno when a lot of us, when we're trying to bring together very transdisciplinary kinds of resources to tell a historical narrative. So when I'm bringing in, you know, Combs on Simon Don with Qing history, this involves a similar kind of translation and weaving together to create this the semblance of a coherent story in a way that I'm going to argue is um, similar to the art of the DJ. Um, and then we have distortion, translation, remixing. I'm just going to put this out here. This is taking a sound and putting an effect on it. And I'm not going to show you this so that we can get to the ching, um, so that you're actually distorting or changing the character of the sound. And basically, I mean, this is, again, a kind of translation, right? The final product. There are two kinds of final products that you can generate, at least for a DJ. One is live. It's a collective experience that's produced by all of the people who are in the room, in the physical location, or it can be recorded, which is an object that can be sort of individually or collectively engaged, and that can be circulated. Okay, And again, there are analogs here, ideally. Okay, so we've got DJing as history. We've talked about storytelling equipment, programming, sampling, juxtaposing, distortion, the final products, etc. All right, so now, what about history as DJing? And here we come to really the final part of this. Okay, this is the part that I want to really think about this and think about this not in terms of basic overarching kind of conceptual frames, but what can happen when you try at least to materialize this, to put this in action. And what can happen, um, I will show you. Okay. The example that I'm going to show you is an example of my trying to do this and sort of analogize this practice as, um, as a historian sort of constructing and working with an archive 
in a way that resulted in a completely different object coming out of the text that I was looking at than I was looking for initially and that I would have ever thought to look for initially. Or, uh, yes, initially at the beginning. And this is a story about the emergence of the voice um, as a historical object in Qing text. Okay? It's not what I initially set out to look at, um, and I'll, I'll show you how that works. So step one, right? Making an archive, programming, and selection. So what's the archive from which the vocal emerges in Qing texts? What wound up happening is that my programming, my, my um, set of materials from which I sampled, looked like this. Okay, what is this? These are not texts, I'm going to take you through them one by one, that you usually put together in a story about Qing history. They're certainly not texts that you usually see as part of a history of science in China, which is my field, um, Chinese science and medicine. Um, and this only happened, and I think it, it happened as a result of this practice. So what do we have here? We have, first of all, translation manuals, okay? So what does this have? I'm going to take you through this quickly. This is a page from a translation manual produced in the 14th century but used by students in the Qing, which is a glossary of terms for body parts, where um, you have Chinese up here and then a Chinese transliteration of Mongolian terms down here, okay, so for each one. So here's the body, here's another one, another one, the other one, the head, the eye, etc. Now each one of these terms looks like this, and so I started wondering what's going on here, because if you read Chinese, you might notice this isn't really a character. Hey, this doesn't exist um, in Chinese texts. What you have here, um, and this, is the, this was the initial, I thought I was working on a history of translation. Okay, this is what I was doing. But what's going on here? What you have here is this is a unique system of transcribing Mongolian sounds into Chinese by repurposing Chinese characters in ways that otherwise out of this context aren't usually used in order to give you directions for how to shape your mouth when you're, produ when you're producing that sound otherwise. So what this tells you when you see this symbol, it tells you make the sound in your throat instead of the front of your mouth. So instead of ha, huh, you get ka. Okay? This tells you, this little symbol here, make the sound while trilling the tip of your tongue. So instead of li, you get ri. There's a whole, so what, and I found this by going to the front page of this translation manual where there is a set of directions for translation as body work. Here are symbols, here's what to do with your mouth, your throat, your voice to change the character of your voice when you see them next to individual characters. Okay? So, this is really interesting and it's a way of disciplining the mouth to produce new sounds and to change the character of your voice. This is not what I was expecting to see when looking at a translation manual and it made me wonder, hmm, so what are some other texts that might also similarly be interested in either the disciplining of the mouth and the throat to produce sound or otherwise the production of sound with this part of the body, like this is interesting. So you find when you start looking for those sorts of things and sort of looking at that sample, at that bit of that text, which is a very specific bit, it's not the bit that is usually looked at in that text, you start seeing things like this. So natural history text concerned with the names and voices of animals. This is from a 19th century text and it's a set of, t it's a document that incidentally happens to include a whole lot of descriptions of the material, medicinal, and sort of magical properties of not just human voices, but also animal voices. And this is an example, this is a phoenix whose voice has medicinal properties. So again, this sort of material efficacy of the voice. You also start seeing texts like this, um, anatomical accounts of the mouth and throat. So this is a page from what's often translated as the Manchu Anatomy, okay, the, the Imperially Commissioned uh, Complete Record of the Body. And what you see when you start looking at this is pages and pages, actually prior to this, of descriptions of different ways that different kinds of physical anatomy of the voice produce different regional accents and produce different voices among speakers. And this is written in the Manchu text and it's not, there's no Chinese version of this. Again, this becomes part of the archive of this production of the voice, okay? You also start seeing the relevance of texts like this, which otherwise don't typically come into the history of Chinese science. Manuals for Qing opera singers, okay? Which include things like this, if you start looking for them, okay? 
rules and disciplines for shaping the mouth and breath, how to move the mouth and its parts, how many mouths worth of breath to expel, how to place and direct your head, what's a normal voice, what's abnormal, and how to identify um, problems with that. Okay? This becomes, again, taking that part out of this text and putting it next to the others, you start to be able to see an emergent story of the voice that transcends these very different textual genres and media. Finally, um, and I won't go into too much detail about this, texts on phonology. Okay, it's the phonology of Chinese in particular, which again are all about how to use the tongue and the mouth to produce new sounds, to learn rules for shaping the mouth and breath in consistent ways, and actually um, here sort of map and classify the sounds of Chinese according to where in your breath, in your throat, and in your mouth you're actually producing the terminology. Again, this is. Uh, this becomes part of this general history. So this becomes the archive from which you are sampling and that you're putting together that generates, I think, a very different kind of um, object than I would, certainly than I would have seen otherwise in looking for any of these individually. All right. So this archive initially came together through sampling from one or two of these texts and then trying to find other samples that they would speak with in other texts. Okay, so importantly, this is a process of generating an archive through attentiveness to these phenomena that otherwise I would not have, I, I would not have put this archive together and made these texts speak to each other and considered them all relevant to the same problem. Okay? Again, like initially I was trying to understand translation. And that's what this was a story about, and I stumbled onto this. Okay? So what you get, the samples that you get when you start putting these together, you get directions for how to shape your mouth and breath when producing foreign sounds. You get accounts of animal voices. You get guides to producing the names of objects in different languages, descriptions of different voices that result from different shapes of the mouth and throat anatomy and their variations, directions for how to shape your mouth properly, directions for how to sing, explanations of vocal sounds in Chinese and other languages based on landscapes of the mouth. These are all samples from very, very different texts that all come together, I think, to produce um, a coherent story, I think. Okay? So how are these juxtaposed and mixed? They're mixed into a story that becomes a story about the emergence of the voice in, in the Qing as an object that is material that's about material that can be shaped. Okay? It's about the voice as languaged, as fundamentally um, sort of imbricated in the production of language and of naming. And it's about ultimately, it becomes about, and I can talk about this last part um, if you want um, in, in some detail later, it becomes about understanding the Qing voice as a means of identification and as a form of identity. And the voice is not just human here, the voice is also animal. And in other ways we can sort of talk about if you're interested. There are also material objects that have voices, um, and this all becomes part of this story. Okay, so this becomes a history of the voice in translation, sort of to try to take this and sort of remix it and, and put it in terms that are slightly different. Okay, so the final product, arguably here, that I that I am suggesting um, we think about and that came from thinking about the historical craft as a craft of the DJ was I think a very different kind of historical narrative and a different kind of object that emerges from a very different kind of bibliography than I would have gotten certainly otherwise when looking at any of these texts individually or looking at genealogically what I should have been looking at in relation to any of them individually if you follow disciplinary norms. Okay? So what's the take home? So now we're finally at the end, or at least at the end of my talking at you. What's the take home here? Well, I hope there are um, just a few take homes here. All right, we talked about history as DJing. This is history through articulating fragments, sampling, and recombination. Okay, this is history as juxtaposition, and I think a, a fundamentally different kind of way, craft-wise, than some of us may think about our practice otherwise. Meaning and narrative here emerge not through causal linear linkages. It's not a narrative that follows individuals and the decisions that they make over time. Meaning emerges out of a set of juxtapositions. Okay, it's very different. 
And it's a means of trying to access different kinds of historical objects. So I'm not proposing here that we necessarily replace um, you know, all the great history that we're doing with something like this. You can't ask the same kinds of questions with this kind of history. You can't answer the same kinds of questions. Instead, it's a way of trying to complicate the field a little bit and make room for other ways of trying to understand the texts of the past that I think produce some surprising kinds of objects that then may have ramifications for other kinds of histories afterwards. So thank you um, for listening. And I'm happy to talk to you about all elements of this. And you can clap now. OK. <laughs> all right.